Thank you so much, Karula. Also, you gained a minute, so we are in a very pleasant predicament. Of course, of course. Uh, uh, I, I, I've learned in Germany that when you are in Switzerland and the train arrives late and you look at the Swiss clock, there's only one possibility you are dreaming. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because both the trains and the clocks are perfect. Uh, or you suffer from hallucination. But in any case, I'm very, very glad that we are only um, 15 minutes late. And uh, I would say we have now 15 minutes discussion of the second part um, of our afternoon session. And then we extend to all uh, the lectures, both in the early afternoon and in this morning. So who wants to begin to ask questions? Well, since nobody raised that, I have a very short question to you, Carola. Um, and it's on an issue which involves me personally because my wife is Korean. You mentioned that the Asian, the Chinese immigrants, feel far less uh, hostility than people, let's say, from the Dominican Republic and Haiti, the two countries in Hispaniola. And I'm asking myself, is it really so that xenophobia is mainly connected to the race difference? If this is the case, then it's difficult to explain why people from East Asia who are evidently different, while not every Latino belongs to a different race, feel less hostility. Or is it not so that there is a stereotype people coming from certain parts of the world will be a burden on the economic system of the country, while if people, even if they are racially very different, but are presumed to integrate into the workforce quickly, are more welcome. So that an economic calculation is a stronger predictor of behavior than racial difference? It's a great question. And I think it's a little bit of both. So I, I want to address that in a couple of levels. First of all, one issue is the issue of do you belong or not? And the kind of the, the issue of being a perpetual foreigner, which is actually identified as a, as a phenomena by uh, folks in the Asian community who who named that you could be a 15th generation Japanese American and still be called out as an outsider. You know, oh, you speak English so well, uh, that, that kind of thing. So one thing is the issue of being named as somehow an outsider. Another issue is the level, the kind of the stereotypes associated with your group. And Susan Fisk and her colleagues have done work that shows that you can, there's relative, uh, there's different kinds of stereotypes that, that uh, around different groups. So there's issues around warmth and you know, you're going to be warm versus cold to different groups. There are, uh, you know, there's gr there are issues around being fearful, uh, envy. So there, you know, there, different uh, gr groups elicit different types of emotional responses in different contexts. So Korean immigrants, for example, have there are different stereotypes in the U.S. about Korean immigrants than there are in Japan. In Japan, Korean immigrants are seen as low status, uh, as being prone to criminality. Uh, in the U.S., you know, it's more stereotypes around they're, you know, they work too hard and they're making our kids look bad in schools. Uh, you know, so it. You know, so it's uh, so it, it's a complex. So the and you know, there's an and 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 so and socioeconomic status has a as a piece to that. So, uh, you know, uh, Indian Americans in the U.S., there's very high levels of educational, they're very high, more educated than the average American, uh, and many of them are doing quite well economically. So the stereotypes around them are going to be quite different. They're still going to be viewed as, well, are you really American? Um, so it's, it's a complicated question, and you point to, a, to an important set of ones. I, I really enjoyed these papers. Um, quite interesting. But in each case, I, I found myself asking um, a similar question, but sort of in um, different organizational places. So, you, you know, you, sp you spoke of things that schools might do, innovative things that NGOs and others are working on, different policies in different countries. And I just, I wonder is, in these various domains, is there some 
evidence about what are the constitution, what, what makes things that travel well? Because this is not that travel well, right? So th these are not, these problems aren't going to be solved if one classroom does X or if one NGO does X or one nation state does X. And are we beginning to learn about the, the character of programmatic interventions that have the capacity for scale and spread? Uh, if you read the Global Compact on Refugees, and then I think there's been a more recent Refugees 2030 uh, document that's trying to get into a little bit more of the implementation beyond the, the guidance. I think there are general guidelines of what an inclusive education system does. Um, that if you read about it, you know, they're not that different from what a quality education system does, period, right? But it is the idea of providing equity as well as quality between the uh, educational context experienced by refugees and the ones experienced by host communities. One thing to keep in mind is that, you know, I mean, this is the truth in the Cox's Bazaar, the host community is uh, the lowest income area of Bangladesh. So um, you get, uh, we were just there in November for two weeks, the, the host community um, is now doing things like getting, uh, fake UNHCR ID in order to exit, right? Like there's things like that that happen when resource differentials are created. Um, so I think uh, the issues of equity are really important. Um, I, I, I do think at a policy level, you're not really no anymore talking about programs, but you are talking about kind of principles that are about quality and then some of these things like, you know, should you be monitoring and evaluating how kids are doing, how they're progressing, how they're actually learning. I mean, the big challenges for SDG4 are measuring actual learning instead of access, and then quality, which never made it into any of the indicators. But those are the big agenda items for education uh, for SDG4 as a whole, and that applies, I think, to this context as well. If we're not keeping track of quality, if we're not paying attention to the workforce's ability to actually provide instructional quality in the classroom, if we're not building um, strategies for kind of things like quality improvement, uh, these systems will look a lot like systems in low-income countries in general uh, of public education, right? They'll just have these further inequities that have to do with language, that have to do with discrimination and intergroup uh, relations and further marginalization um, that is built into uh, differential access to the um, labor market, um, to credentialing, um, to occupations, to higher schooling, all of that. Ambassador Molina. <coughs> Dr. Kroll. Do you have an experience, or you know some problem, about uh, virtual classrooms? So it's possible to teach those children that are moving from one country to other, having the, the program uh, prepare <coughs> in the origin of uh, the, the country of origin, because I think it's the compromise of that country not to miss these children who left the country. So it's possible to prepare in a lab these class, the virtual classes, so can serve on these refugees uh, camp. Do you think it's possible or is there any experience of it? I think maybe Hero is better <laughs> able to answer that because I think uh, both uh, Microsoft and, and the Lego Foundation are doing things like that in the camps, if I'm correct. My, my experience mostly in formal education and this is happening more in sort of more informal uh, context. Sorry, the question was about what about classrooms? I didn't quite catch. It's possible to create a virtual system for those children that are leaving the country, so the teachers on the, the country of origin can produce in a lab a package of uh, the lessons, so it can serve in those camps, following the program that can, is uh, legal, uh, legal uh, instruction. So it will be nice so the children can be out of the system by one, two years. They can follow up all this uh, process. Uh, yeah, I think it's, there's been informal efforts for families to learn um, 
one of the things that's happened, I think, is that families retain, as they often do in immigration, contacts <laughs> with members of their networks and their families who remain in the host, in the home country. So there may be kind of information about what's going on in terms of schooling, but I, I don't know of any formal structure for that kind of curriculum to travel outside of the borders so that kids are prepared to, to re-enter. Um, these, these gaps are huge, um, so uh, because the Rohingya, for example, have not had access to any form of uh, formal schooling now for two and a half, close to two and a half years. So none of them have had any access. Jeff. Of course, one of the things that happened in Turkey is indeed that first uh, the Syrian children were taught in these temporary education centers where they were taught in Syrian curriculum in Arabic. So they, they actually created the system in Turkey with the idea, okay, maybe they are here for one or two years, and they go back into the system, and they didn't lose any years. But of course, <laughs> all our experience in terms of migration and refugees learns us this is not happening. So that's the big risk you run, that you teach these children in a curriculum that has no value at all in the country <laughs> where they are supposed, in the end, to make a living. And that's exactly what happened to the Syrian children in Turkey. So it's, it's difficult. <laughs> hey, Corolla, thank you for a really wonderful uh, paper and very depressing also. Um, what is the evidence about changes over time? I may have missed that. Uh, but are things getting worse in the United States? And can you identify a George W. Bush effect, a global war on terrorism effect, a, uh, a Donald Trump effect? Uh, because what the kids hear is, uh, maybe uh, the microphone. Thank you for the question. I all that evidence. I can, I, I can tell you that the sentence completions that I, gave, that I started with was 20 years ago. And we followed the kids for five years. We did it every year for five years, and it stayed pretty stable. So that was interesting. So they were all newcomer kids, and, um, and they had the same kinds of answers. Now, imagine if we did it today. It would be, it would be a thing that I would say. Uh, but I don't have that data because I didn't, wasn't. I, I, it was longitudinal, but not that longitudinal. Uh, we do have evidence uh, that, um, that 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 I pointed to that from doc, from Professor Rogers' study, where they they collected data right after the Trump election, and uh, from 500 principals, and they're saying incivility is way up and anti-immigration in particular. I should let you speak to that. Uh, so, you know, we, we don't really have uh, the clear evidence longitudinally on my kids, but we have, we have some evidence that, yes, xenophobia is up, hate, club, hate crimes are up. Uh, there are cascading effects yeah. in schools. Introspectively, I'm falling to pieces, so uh, I can yeah. imagine no, it's, uh, it, that, that kids that are hearing this are similarly reacting. We also have a lot of evidence of rising hate crimes, mm -hmm. uh, mass shootings, mm -hmm. and yep. so on. So uh, I would just, am I just picking pieces no, no, out of the No, you're not picking air, pieces. I, I, I would, I yeah. would refer you to uh, John's report as a, as a good, you know, a solid piece of strong evidence. That we actually did a survey in the spring of 2017 of teachers across the United States first. And in that initial survey, we asked, have things changed um, for this year from previous years or this semester from previous years? And, and so we saw evidence there of heightened sense of stress amongst immigrant youth. Um, that's, that's as close as uh, a piece of evidence as I can offer relative to added effects. Aside from the interview data where many teachers and principals have said things have gotten substantially worse since the Trump presidency started and that students increasingly feel emboldened, mm -hmm. that's the word that constantly mm -hmm. is used, to use 
xenophobic, hateful, racist rhetoric in classrooms and other spaces. Another round of survey data this spring to see what it means four years into this. It would be really valuable. In terms of uh, policy take up, there is also, um, this is kind of like more policy oriented information, but there have been higher declines in food stamp receipt among, for example, citizen children and immigrant families. Um, at, uh, so there have been these like pre post uh, studies, pre and post the Trump administration's uh, Trump being elected. So, yeah, states like California have tracked that. Native researcher, and I've been doing work with the undocumented uh, community for a very long time, and I have heard over and over, you know, the stories from young people who are saying it's a lot worse, and teachers who are saying it's a lot worse. So, I mean, they're all point little points, little and large points of evidence that are telling us what we intuitively would guess is true. Thank you so much for um, wonderful, wonderful uh, papers. I have um, a, a comment uh, and then a question um, for Hero and for Maurice. Um, the architectures put in place, what matters flowing from the forceful displacement of populations were predicated on the idea of non-refoulement, the idea that safety could be guaranteed temporarily as the displace would make the journey back to the home countries when safety allowed. This was the time when it was the clash of super states that created the massive displacements of peoples. We live in another world. We live in a world where war and terror, corruption, unchecked criminality, unchecked climate change have become the main drivers of the forceful displacement of folks. Nine out of 10 uh, displaced will never make it to uh, the Netherlands. They will stay in, within the boundaries of the nation state, or they will spill over into neighboring states that simply don't have the institutional capacity to manage the transition at a time when the average length of residency in the camp, and Hiro, you correct me here, uh, Sarah, Dryden, uh, Peterson, uh, estimates that today, a girl from Syria that is displaced will either stay in one of these uh, zones of confinement that are at the center of the architecture that Europe and the United States have put in place. We don't have a crisis of immigration or of refugees. We have a crisis of confinement in the world. A Syrian child that is pushed out will be in limbo for, I believe, Hiro, please help me, 20, over 20 years in, uh, out of these conflict zones. When unchecked, unchecked climate change, when uncontrolled criminality are the main drivers, the notion that safety will once allow the, the, this place to return home is a mirage that can no longer be seriously considered. This is why the idea of uh, uh, teaching the Syrian children in Turkey, in Arabic, so they would go back home it's a fairy tale. We pretend to be teaching and we pretend to put in place the structures and strictures that will, that will uh, uh, provide their, uh, their safety. Now, 
because like Jeff, uh, the despair is so corrosive. I have a question and a comment uh, where there is hope. Germany took 1.4 million refugees. Is that correct, Maurice, about? Yeah, Germany took 1.4 million people, and today, this is 1915. Today, the connection, the connectivity of the Syrian, uh, the Syrian refugees in Germany is extraordinary. In the order of plus 70% are now working. They're making a living. You know Freud's famous line, love and work. This is the formula for a happy life. Talk, can you talk a little bit about what we can learn from this German experience? 1.5 million, 1.4 million people, five years later, people are connected. They're working, they're contributing. And as uh, you know, EO, as um, uh, um, Bill Wilson uh, has uh, elaborated, work is so fundamental for the human soul. First of all, let me, let me say something which already got me in, into trouble before, but uh, ab about the UNCR and the whole concept of emergency relief and emergency education. And this fits in this sort of schemes that, uh, so we do, we do not need to provide real educational opportunities for these children because it's an emergency. So that makes it possible to say, like in Lebanon, these children can be kept in afternoon classes separately. Who's paying for this? Basically, UNCR. And they agreed with the Lebanese government, with the Lebanese educational authorities for this arrangement. So they keep these children in an emergency situation rather than in a regular situation in schools. And, and that's a huge problem. So it's also the discourse of these big organizations, and because they understand they have to work with the governments, so they align with these governments, they put the money in, but they don't push for formal, regular education for these children. And that's a, that's a huge problem. And of course, from the perspective of Lebanon, it's also understandable. Half of the children in public schools are Syrian. Half. It's a huge issue. And there is a private system, and the public system is losing out already to the private system. So they were thinking, if we integrate the Syrian children in the public system, the public system will go down. So I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's all politics, of course. But I think these huge organizations like UNCR and the donor countries have a role to not accept that. The same happened, of course, with the temporary education centers when Europe gave money to sustain these centers. So, I mean, this needs to be discussed. And, and then, of course, yeah, there, there's, I mean, it's not so much, I would say, the, what is happening to the Syrian refugees and, and how they are integrating into European society. I'm hopeful, sure, but I think it's way too early to make a verdict on this. But, I mean, if we've looked at previous refugee groups from Yugoslavia, from Chile, in Europe, actually, it's a, there's hardly any difference between these groups now in Sweden, in the Netherlands, or Germany, as into the mainstream population. So, there, and they are now productive people in society, paying taxes and contributing to the wealth of these countries. So. There's no reason, again, there's no reason to make this uh, a failure. It's only political reasons why choices are being made that are against these children in schools and against, like also for the Netherlands, why didn't we open up these possibilities to the age of 24 
to, to follow training, uh, vocational training. There's no, but I mean, then the political decision needs to be made that we invest money first in these programs and expect later some revenues from it. And that's a political sell. And Merkel was able to do this. And that's something to applaud, of course. Yes, this is a question to Maurice. So you know European situation very well. Have you made an in-depth study of the difference of reception of refugees between France and Germany, which is incredible? Do you have some in-depth analysis of this? I mean, it's a shame for my country. <coughs> France was able to, to develop this policy without any critical voices in Europe. I mean, in Europe people are critical about Italy, about Greece, but in reality what is happening in France is often much more <coughs> severe than in places like Italy and, uh, and, and Greece. So, yeah, I, I agree, <laughs> but I, I, I would not expect the French government to uh, fund such a study. <laughs> I'm very moved by something Marie said, um, and I want to bring it back to the Global Compact and the opportunity that it presents to us. Um, even the UNHCR will barter and talk politics and say, well, we'll give you this if you give us that, and, and ignore absolute morality. I mean, we're talking about children's lives here. And we have Pope Francis, who is an ethical, moral um, expert. I mean, uh, he has an authority, is what I mean. He has the moral authority to say, this is not acceptable. There is absolutism here that needs to be brought back in. This is absolutely wrong and we will sign this global compact, heads of state, because it's not acceptable. This isn't about bartering the, the um, you know, what is convenient, what is political. I think some of that needs to come back into the discourse and this is a perfect opportunity for, it, for that to happen. If it doesn't happen now, it'll never happen. To quote Hillel the Elder, or to paraphrase, if not now, when? If not us, who? Exactly as it was written in the program. I'm not Swiss, Carola, but as a German, we look with great envy to our southern neighbor and we try to emulate it. And so I think we can even finish uh, two minutes early if there is no other question.